So just to prove Florian wrong that I'm not scared to stand here with my funny hair. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm here presenting work of my uh, colleague Heike Peter, which some of you might know better on her maiden name, Heike Bock. Uh, also, like me, formerly from the University of Bern, uh, we worked. And um, as you might notice from the slide, I have a slightly different head on, uh, just fitting with my hair. This, this is not an ESA presentation. This is actually a presentation from the work my company does uh, for ESA and uh, which uh, mostly performed by Heike, but she preferred to have holidays this week. Uh, she's been traveling a lot uh, in the last uh, weeks. So, um, Why am I standing here? I mean, we could have submitted this presentation also to uh, Jeff's uh, session on scientific applications of IGS, because we are actually using IGS products for uh, the Sentinel POD we do, um, and actually we use them for the highest quality products we have to produce in that, which is actually a uh, project we do in a consortium headed by GMV. Um, we have a poster on it as well. Jaime and his colleagues um, have a poster on this as well. So, uh, and the thing we are faced with, and that's our responsibility as company, is that if the IGS changes something, uh, like changing to the ITF 2014, and of course such a um, Leo POD we do with a PPP approach, uh, we get a jump in our time series, just like Tom was talking about on Monday, and we have to do reprocessing. And since IGS is not all that quick with reprocessing, it's actually our job uh, to do the reprocessing in this project so that we can, again, have a continuous time series of Sentinel POD products, which, of course, you can imagine for global warming, global sea level rise, is of the highest importance. Um, this is the first time this happened in the project that we now actually have to do reprocessing. So it's for us also getting ready, making sure, proving that we are, our products are as good as the IGS products. And uh, also try to maybe overcome some of the challenges we have in using IGS products. Uh, try to make it a little bit easier for ourselves when we actually do the reprocessing. Uh, so rather than doing the 24-hour products we get from IGS, doing a longer arc because the products we have to provide are quite varied. Um, we use different arc lengths in the different uh, product, have different requirements for arc lengths. Uh, so we're planning to do a 36-hour arc. And um, the good thing for the IGS in this is that actually we are prepared to also submit these products as IGS products for reprocessing. Maybe Tom would be interested in getting them. <laughs> But anyway, um, so we're starting to do this work to prove to ESA that we're capable of doing it and that we're aligned to the IGS and uh, getting all the tuning in place uh, that uh, we're actually are doing what we need to do. Uh, first, a short introduction for those of you who don't know what Copernicus or Sentinel or, or these kind of things are. Um, Copernicus is the, the bigger name for the ESA EU project, so it's a similar size project like Galileo. It's a 20-year program which ensures that all the kind of instruments we've been flying to monitor the Earth will have, uh, are flying in the next 20 years to ensure the time series of these instruments, which is of extreme importance. Um, it's different satellites, so they're actually Sentinel 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 you may have heard of, but 4, 5, 6 are actually instruments on different missions. 1, 2, and 3 are really full satellite missions. And for this 20-year program, they're all envisioned to have an A, B, C, and D version of the satellites. Uh, right now we have A and B flying for Sentinel 1 and 2, and A is flying for Sentinel 3, uh, B to be launched soon. And C and D are a little bit more future projects where we talk about 2021, I think, that they're starting to launch. Interesting thing there is that besides um, that those will not no longer be just GPS receivers, those will be GPS Galileo receivers. So we very much hope that by 2021, um, okay, space typically has some delays, maybe 2022, the IGS would have GPS and Galileo project, uh, products um, as final products. So typical Earth missions all flying around the 600 to 800 kilometer altitudes, uh, sun synchronous orbits because we want to see the Earth on the similar aspects. Sentinel-1 being the SAR mission, Sentinel-2 being more of the, the Earth land mission, Sentinel-3 um, being the altimetry, so sea level rise mission. And originally, I would have said, okay, Sentinel-3 has the highest uh, POD requirements, uh, but these days it's actually uh, Sentinel-1, the SAR measurements, where they make basically 
two pictures at different locations, presumably close by locations to make an interferometric SAR, where the 3D location, uh, 3D position of the satellites is the limiting factor. So the most stringent requirement we have on, on satellite orbit quality is for Sentinel-1 for the non-time critical NTC, as you see on the um, slide here, um, where we have a, a five centimeter 3D requirement for the uh, LEO POD accuracy. Uh, Sentinel-3, the altimetry has a three centimeter radial requirement, which is a bit easier uh, actually than five centimeter 3D. So you see these are quite stringent requirements. We have all kinds of requirements, near real-time products, uh, short-time critical products, um, for which we have a commercial service provider, as the IGS products, when we started the project, were not necessarily available or reliable enough for that. But for the highest accuracy, the non-time critical products, we use the IGS final uh, products, and those are highlighted here in red, where we are reliant on IGS. <laughs> So now coming to, to our work or uh, the investigations we did. Uh, so to prepare that um, show that we are in line with what the work we do. So this is not work I do at ESA. This is work we do as a, as a company with a similar software like ESA, but it's diverging. It's an old software. We have to keep it up to spec. Uh, so we have to prove that we're doing a right job. And uh, so we did a number of different solutions. Uh, we also used um, products from all the different analysis centers to see how we're doing compared to those and what, what kind of influences they have. And that's actually where we started to see very interesting things because the, the variety between the analysis centers in the orbit modeling, which was in the end the decision why we submitted it to this session, uh, is pretty large, and uh, so you get and you get very systematic differences if you look at the differences between the products from the different analysis centers. Um, and basically, the biggest difference is that we have many analysis centers which are still working with no a priori model at all, using the Ecom uh, one model. And uh, you have a number of centers which have uh, either JPL with its own uh, solar radiation pressure model, ESA with its box wing approach, which is actually quite similar, which is interesting to see. And, um, but you get very large differences. So we tested what this has as an effect on our LEO orbits, uh, because we get a mixture from the IGS where we use the combined IGS final product. And uh, we're looking for millimeter sea level rise, a um, few centimeters um, differential SAR things, and we want to, under, we want to understand uh, what happens when we go to these extremes. So we did a number of different solutions. Uh, so the two extremes being solution one, where we have no a priori model, which I think is by these days obsolete. No analysis center in the IGS should be doing that. Uh, and our solution five, where we use the IGS box wing model, there, of course, we run into the same problems uh, which Florian showed yesterday, that with the two Fs, uh, the, the standard IGS values for box wing are not really good. Uh, so you have to tune that a bit, and uh, we, we played a bit with re-radiation, but this solution tree, I won't go into too much detail. If you just look at the RMS statistics, which what we look at at the IGS website, uh, the difference between the solutions are like 10 to 20 millimeters, which looks fine. Yeah, we, we have five centimeter orbit requirements, so 20 millimeter differences between the two extreme cases doesn't sound like much. But if you go and look into the details, uh, they're very, very systematic. So this is a plot, oops, uh, my, my view changed here. Um, sorry, it's okay, it's okay. Um, so here I have a plot, it's over full year orbit differences. Uh, from our analysis, the only difference is the a priori model we used. In case one, no a priori model. Case two, uh, the box wing model with the IGS values as a priori. Plotted as a function on the x-axis as the argument of latitude with respect to the sun, and on the y-axis the bad angles or the elevation of the sun above the orbital plane. So a one-day orbit actually goes from the left to the right on, on pre pretty much a horizontal line, and over the year the satellites go up and down on this beta angle. And so you see at high beta angles we get a nice twice per revolution cross-track difference, which is at the 40 millimeter level. And this is extremely systematic. You'll have a whole GPS plane at a high beta angle where you make four centimeter amplitude errors. And that's basically unacceptable, huh? I think. 
But uh, similar also in the radial component, and this is where we started to see uh, a very fuzzy picture. Um, we had to take the two R's and the two F's separately because they behave very different radially. As Peter uh, Steinwerth was pointing out, solar radiation pressure modeling has an extreme effect on your radial component, and we're pretty insensitive to it. I mean, the power trust, we can apply to our solution so you don't see anything. Yeah, the radial of your orbit changes, but... Uh, the rest of your solution is pretty much still the same. Um, but for sea level rise, I wouldn't like these differences in, in the product I'm using, uh, even if they're largely reflected in the clocks. So for the two hours, you see a 40, centimeter, 40 millimeter difference, also very periodic. Nice thing here is it's a once per F, so the ECOM parameters, the ECOM 1 parameters can absorb this. They cannot absorb the cross-track ones. There you need to do ECOM 2. And for the two Fs, we actually get the opposite sign of the effect. And uh, similar size, this is also the same scale, the same, th same year, same solutions, basically. And, uh, but it's also very clear that with these IGS default values, we're doing something wrong. So we've been trying to tune this similar to what ESA has done uh, and, and get it also in line with what ESA gets. And the good thing is actually we, we go back to so this, the extreme one seems to be really out, uh, far out from doing nothing. So have no box wing for 2F seems to be better than doing the IGS values. So if you tune it, you go back. And this is actually the difference between our tuned solution and then the IGS box wing values, which at now at the 25 millimeter level, the scale, uh, we're actually going back to the no a priori. So it's actually, that's why I changed the title slightly. Um, if you don't do a box wing, model, it might actually be a smaller error than if you do the IGS box wing model for the 2F with the current values, but I'm talking this week, I heard there are some tuned values from Oliver and stuff which we'll have a look at how we can uh, use them. Now this was the GPS side of things. So this is for us the input. This is the product you provide for us and, and the issues we have to deal with. Uh, the interesting thing now for us is of course, what does this do to our LEO orbit in a systematic way? And uh, so we used these different solutions um, uh, to do Sentinel-1 mainly. We also did some Sentinel-3. I'll focus on the Sentinel-1 results. They're quite comparable. Sentinel-1 was in a nicer beta regime uh, for Eclipse. So again, the differences between the solutions, if you just look at RMS statistics, are, are small. Three millimeters in, in the cross-track is the largest, although we see a consistent seven millimeter mean in the cross-track, which is not so nice. Uh, with the tuned box wing model, the difference are then only a few millimeters, and the re-radiation basically has no effect, so I'll discard that for the rest. Um, but again, if you then look at the uh, differences over time, uh, you start to see something very significant. Um, this is now just a function of time on the x-axis and the cross-track differences for Sentinel-1A uh, and 1B, very similar satellites. They are just differently uh, spaced in the same orbit. Uh, so we see a very similar effect. The satellite's actually moving towards eclipse. So at the end of the series, it's just starting to get into its, its eclipse uh, period. And uh, so you can expect a symmetrical period uh, with a positive cross-track differences uh, at the other side of the eclipse. But you see here that we get a systematic 10 millimeter differences. Um, I should use the mouse probably for that if it works. Yeah, uh, at the very beginning where we're far away from eclipse, well, far. Uh, which, of course, is for sea level rise studies and stuff, not so nice to have. And uh, this is the effect, basically, we see in the LEO, uh, the difference between having a no a priori model in your GPS or having a box wing model as a priori in your GPS. So this is uh, the size of error we would get from, from certain analysis center in the IGS compared to uh, probably those who are doing a slightly better job. It's got a bit more scarier, although the scale is much smaller. If we look at this as a projection on the Earth, so a latitude longitude plot of the long track differences of this satellite uh, from the two solutions, so a solution without a priori box wing and with a priori box wing, uh, you see you get a very systematic effect over the Earth. And this is what we, of course, in, in, in Earth sensing satellites really dislike. Uh, the scale here is two and a half millimeters, not so much, but Sea level rise is a signal like one millimeter a year. Um, 
tendency to grow. Uh, well, it's not it's four millimeters per decade, uh, but uh, it's uh, not nice to have these kind of patterns in, in, uh, in your Leo products coming from basically a failure to model things which in the IGS have been long known that they should be modeled. Uh, and this is similar, uh, the effect in, in the set orientation of our LEO orbit. So sort of a geocenter effect, you could say, on, on, on the LEO. It's only one millimeter, but I mean, these are the kind of signals we're looking for. Yeah? This is a, a one millimeter, very systematic signal we see over the first 130 days of um, 2017 we've used for this so far. So um, we also looked into what does the tuning effect of the 2F uh, do on, in this. So if we just change the 2Fs, where we know, okay, in the previous solution we had some mismodeling of that, but most of what we saw previously was really no a priori versus uh, a box wing model. Um, so if we just tune the 2Fs, we see quite similar things. Smaller size, of course, uh, a few millimeters systematic in the cross track. And also, again, a very nice projection along track of the errors now on the one millimeter level. And um, with that, I would like to come to the conclusions. Um, the Sentinel missions are depending on the IGS final products. Our highest accuracy products are depending on the IGS. Um, the good thing for the IGS is with the reprocessing, we may actually, as a Sentinel um, project, contribute to the IGS in that we make our reprocessing products available. Um, but also in preparing for this, we have noticed that there are really significant modeling issues in the IGS GPS orbit products. And we are using them as a scientific user, and we really have a call to you to improve your products. Uh, uh, the orbit modeling issues have long been known. Uh, there are solutions for it. Uh, please get on with it and implement them uh, through all analysis centers. Uh, because they have a systematic influences on, on the LEO solutions. And if you want to serve this community, you have to shape up and improve. Uh, because you are influencing the science out of these missions. Of course, we need from that more and better information from the satellite systems. So uh, the things Galileo is doing are really great, uh, very much appreciated. I hope we can get that from GPS as well and soon, uh, because this will reduce uh, the mismodeling we have. Uh, we also looked into this 24 hour because we have to do certain arc lengths, so we have to concatenate different IGS orbits um, to, to get whatever piece we need to process. Um, there's not any significant effect on the results uh, for that, or at least nothing systematic. Uh, but nevertheless, in our reprocessing, we have decided that we will sh for sure will go to the longer arc solutions just to make our life easier and avoid having to concatenate uh, three SP3s and three clock files to be able to do the PPP over a period longer than 24 hours. Something the IGS might want to consider for future products if they want to serve, especially PPP users, which anyway have problems at the day boundaries with the current products. It would be nice to have at least a couple of points extra for the interpolation of the orbit. But okay, that's uh, up to the IGS. I won't push on that. And uh, that's all I wanted to present.